Jesus is the most famous and influential person in human history, and there's not a close second. Even if you don't believe that he was the Son of God or that he came to offer his life as a sacrifice to pay for the sins of all of us, even if you don't accept those truths, you cannot deny his influence in the world. He was a teacher who people actually liked to hear teach. And he ministered not in famous places, but humble places, places you would have a hard time finding on a map. He demonstrated incredible love and acceptance to people who are often treated as outcasts in his culture. He gave people the right to decide for themselves what they would do with the message that he preached. You never see him strong arming, manipulating, or intimidating anyone. For all of human history, kings have kept dates based on the year of their reign. In the fifth year of King Darius's reign, in the ninth year of King Xerxes' reign. But since Jesus came to our world, all kings and kingdoms have been based in the year of his reign. When it says 2018 AD, that actually stands for Anno Domini, which means in the year of our Lord. Everything before him is before Christ, and everything after him is in the year of our Lord. Desperate people pray in Jesus' name. Grateful people worship in Jesus' name. Angry people use Jesus' name to swear. When was the last time you heard anybody use Buddha or Mohammed to let out a little curse under their breath? It's always Jesus. People don't recognize a lot of the things that Jesus inspired or that, that his followers, based on his teaching, were inspired to accomplish. For example, Jesus never married, yet the way he treated and talked to women was so incredibly powerful that more women joined his faith community than any community that had ever existed before. And what's really fascinating is that that was considered a, a, a downside in early Christianity. There were too many women. They didn't have a high opinion in that culture of women. And so it was a downside, and yet Jesus insisted that everyone was welcome. Jesus never wrote a book, but he said something like this, that in addition to loving God with all of our heart and with all of our soul and with all of our strength, we should love God with all of our mind. And so people took that seriously. The idea of putting libraries together, in fact, a lot of the information that was lost in our world and would have been lost forever during what was called the Dark Ages was much of what existed and survived was put together by Christians because they thought information should be saved. Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, Yale were all created by Christ followers who wanted to further education and improve scholarship. Jesus actually said, if you've done this for the least of these, then you've done it for me. That meant that every single human being had significance and purpose and deserved to be treated well. So because people believe that, they actually invented things like hospitals. Prior to Jesus, if you were sick, you either begged or you died. But after Jesus, they actually created hospitals and all kinds of relief efforts. Before Jesus, humility was considered a character defect, a flaw, something you never wanted. It was scorned. You can go back in human history and find the exact moment in human history where humility became a virtue that people aspired to, and it was on the cross of Calvary. Up until that time, it was a liability. After that time, it's considered an asset. There are 6.9 billion people on the face of the planet today, and 2.2 billion of them alive on the earth right now believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and they have accepted his sacrifice for their sins, and they worship him on a regular basis. How many think that's a pretty impressive thing? There's actually more people worshiping Jesus today than people who own smartphones. That should tell you something. In fact, it is estimated that over 15.5 billion people have placed their faith in Christ since Jesus was here on earth in the flesh. So how did one person who lived in a militarily occupied territory and lived in abject poverty and was put to death by government and religious systems before his 34th birthday, how did that person have this much influence? How did he change the world for over 2,000 years? 
And the answer is found in this verse of scripture. Jesus called together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your, what's the next word? Servant. Servant. Whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man, reference to himself, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Here's the point I want you to take away today. If you want to make a difference in our world, you must serve someone other than yourself. If you want to make a difference in our world, you must serve someone other than yourself. Jesus didn't come to be served. He wasn't trying to make his life easier. He wasn't trying to gain more control over governmental agencies so he could impose his will and his ways on society. He wasn't trying to amass great wealth. Someone sent me a little thing this last, uh, in the last couple of weeks about the 20th wealthiest pastors in the world. Guess who did not make the list? <laughs> I was not on there. Let's just see. How, somebody throw a number at me you think the wealthiest pastor in the world is worth. 20 million. He's, he's in the low 20s at 20 million. I know. <laughs> what church is that? You know? Anybody else? Over $1 billion. And two pastors over a billion dollars, and their ministries are in third world nations. Now, it would be very easy for me to be judgmental about that, and I have no idea what they're doing with their money. Maybe they're doing all kinds of things to help the poor and to create job opportunities and do all kinds of entrepreneurial and, and um, uh, help-related things in their culture, so I, I don't want to stand. All I know is, is that when Jesus left this world, he did not have a billion dollars to leave behind. He didn't come to amass great fortune to himself or to make life easier for himself. I have never met a person whose goal was to waste their life, but I have met a lot of people who are doing exactly that. It's not their desire. It's just what's happening. And the reason is they keep waiting for life to begin for them, for something else to happen, something that they want so that now life can be better. If I can get into the school I want, then my life will start. If I can get into the relationship I want, then my life will start. If I get the job I want, then my life will start. If I get the house I want, if I get the salary I want, it seems as though their life is on hold until they get what they want. But guess what happens when we get what we want? We want something else. You are sitting next to a little want monster. <laughs> we can't help ourselves. We always want more. Now listen, I'm not saying it's wrong to have goals and desires, but I think if we feel stuck unless we have those things, we should realize that Jesus never had any of those things, and yet he would made a huge difference in our world. The path to a meaningful life and to a significant life is not determined by how many people serve you. It is determined by how many people you serve. Giving orders or imposing our will actually doesn't improve our world. It makes it worse. That's the problem in our world right now, is that there's so many people who impose their will. So the question is, if serving has so much positive effect in our world, why are we afraid to do it? And I think there's three common fears we have to overcome if we're going to engage in a life of service. And the first fear is this. We have to overcome the fear that we won't have time to do what we enjoy. I mean, after all, don't you want to do what you enjoy? And if you're committed all your time, you won't get to do any of that. And here's the thing. We all think we're actually busier than we are. And I'm not saying we're not busy. We are. 
Studies prove that humans in Western culture right now spend more hours at work a day than almost any generation before us. Absolutely true. But it's also true that we have a fair amount of leisure time that we can devote to something other than just staying alive. For example, uh, in recent studies, they found that two hours and 47 minutes a day are spent watching television by people from the age of 15 to 75. Now, before some of our senior citizens get annoyed at some of the younger for watching television, you should know that the statistics show that senior citizens watch twice as much television as adolescents. So now you have nothing to say. <laughs> There's other things. You, there's leisure activities, spend about uh, 12 minutes a day on those. Uh, socializing and communicating, about 41 minutes on that. Reading, about 19 minutes on that. Participating in sports or exercise, about 19 or 18 minutes on that. Playing games, including video games, about 25 minutes on that. Time to relax and think, about 17 minutes. The truth is, is that just a little under five hours a day is something we have available to us other than just trying to keep a roof on our head and food on the table. And here's the thing, is that when we think about serving, the tendency is to worry, if I get locked in doing this, I'm going to wind up not getting to do something that I really enjoy. If a good opportunity comes along, maybe I will miss it. I got a call one day from a guy and he said, how would you like to be in a race car, on a race track, at race speeds? And I said, let me pray about that. Amen. <laughs> yes. So I drove to where he was, and he put me out on a track, and my insides sloshed back and forth. It's unbelievable how much G-force that creates. I had another friend call me one time and he said, how would you like tickets to a March Madness game in Syracuse, University of Kentucky against West Virginia? I said, let me pray about that. Amen. <laughs> yes. Three tickets. I didn't even know how good the tickets were when we got there. Eight rows back center court. I know. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? It's amazing. And so many of us are afraid that if we commit ourselves to serving, that somehow we are putting away any opportunity to enjoy the good things in life. And it's not true. God does not say that you are supposed to take every spare minute you have and use it serving the needs of others. But he's saying something goes horribly wrong in our world when all we do is either serve ourselves or wait for good things to happen to us. Our world doesn't get better in that climate. And it never will. We can, we can commit a certain amount of time. It doesn't have to be even the majority of your time. Just something to make a difference. And by the way, serving doesn't have to be something you hate. Some people think like there's spiritual value in doing something you hate. I'm not sure there's, that's true. And I can tell you this. If you hate what you're doing, the people you're serving can tell. Like, that attitude gets out of you. You might not think it does, but it does. They can tell. I think that when you serve others doing something you love or enjoy, it actually makes their experience better, too. I really do. Another fear is the fear of being compared to someone else. Because our culture is infected with comparison sickness. And it comes in on all of our smart devices. Thanks to social media, we can now see the highlight moments of everyone we know and love. And it's annoying. <laughs> look at their happy family. Look at, how, look at all the places they get to go and all the things that they get to do. And here's what I want you to know. That's just their highlights. They're editing a lot of stuff out. They really do. There's stuff they don't want you to see. Sue and I were able to get away for a couple days this last week, so we went someplace warm and with palm trees and sunshine and a beach, and we went out on the beach, and there were some young ladies and some little kids and a guy who came down to the beach, and for 30 minutes, all they did was pose for pictures. Down by the water, up in the sand, laying on the towel, pose, 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 and after 30 minutes, they all got up and they left. They weren't there to enjoy the beach. They were there to take pictures of themselves at the beach. And now they can post it on social media and everybody's going, oh, look at all the fun they're having at the beach. They didn't have any fun. I was there, I can tell. They posed and then they left. 
That's not how it's supposed to be. We, we don't, life, that's not real life. That's not, that's not doing that. And so don't compare yourself to all the stuff you see on social media. It's not real. Uh, there's, by the way, there's always somebody who's better at what you do than you are. We can either use that as an opportunity to learn or as an excuse to give up. It's our choice. If someone does it better, learn from them. On-the-job training is probably some of the best training you'll ever get in your life. What we understand is that when I engage in serving, it makes a difference in my world. Do the best you can with what you have where you are. You would not want to have heard the first set of messages I ever preached. It was sad. <laughs> Thank God there were people in the room that loved me and encouraged me because it was not good. But I didn't try to become a minister or a pastor because I thought I was the best at it. I tried because I thought there were people who really could be helped to understand God better. And I still try to get better at this day after day, week after week, month after month. I know you might not see my progress, but I am working at it. <laughs> Do the best you can with what you have where you are. That's what makes the difference. So don't compare. The last fear is we fear of being taken advantage of. And this is a really big fear. We fear people will become demanding. We worry that they will walk all over us. Uh, have you ever been in line when the person in front of you just ripped somebody up one side and down the other because they weren't getting what they wanted, when they wanted, how they wanted, where they wanted, and the way they wanted? And usually they're talking to a person who has absolutely no say in the matter at all. What are you going to do? And whenever I'm behind a person like that, when I'm the next person, I just try to be extra nice to them. Just say, how are you doing? And they shoot me a look. <laughs> and I go, I'm, I know, and I'm sorry. But we're not all like that, you know. We're worried we'll be taken advantage of. Look at the life of Jesus. Can you make the argument that people ran over him and took advantage of him every single day of his life? No. He withdrew from ministry when he was exhausted. He took time away to pray. He would take downtime with some of his closest friends. He was the greatest servant the world has ever seen, yet he could confront religious leaders who disapproved of him. He could say no to crowds who wanted to inaugurate him the next king. He refused to let people put words in his mouth. He spoke truth to power. He advocated for the poor and for the powerless. He wept with those who were grieving and for those who were suffering. He refused a celebrity culture where his followers tried to convince him that he should not, in his position, ever experience any suffering. He said no to that hard and fast. Whatever else you might say about Jesus, you cannot say that he was weak or that he was a pushover, and he was the greatest servant the world has ever seen. Sometimes we'll do this thing where we, we don't want to make a decision. Does anybody else do that besides me? Like, where would you like to eat? Well, I don't want to decide because if it's a bad meal, then it's my fault. <laughs> what movie would you like to see? Well, I don't want to decide because if it's a bad movie, then it's my fault. And a lot of times we, we sound like we're just being agreeable and serving the needs of others. Oh, whatever it is you want. You're not serving their needs. You're trying to avoid responsibility for it all crashing and burning. Okay? That's a form of self-service when you think about it. Sometimes we can serve so that others will recognize us. Sometimes we can serve so that others will appreciate us. Sometimes we can serve so that we can increase options and opportunities for even better things. And all of these are really a form of self-serving. It's not serving the needs of others. So we need to think about this. God is not asking us to be in a position where the whole world is going to take advantage of us. God is asking us to be in a position where we influence and bring change to the whole world. Very different thing. Now, when I talk like this, maybe you're sitting there going, I'm not sure I would make God's team. But just look at a list of some of God's all-stars on his team throughout history. Abraham was on Medicare. Moses had a speech impediment. Joseph was an ex-convict. Rahab had a history of sexual misbehavior. David was a homicidal adulterer. John the baptizer ate bugs. 
Just think about that in front of people. Thomas doubted, Gideon panicked, Martha obsessed over housekeeping and food preparation, Jonah was directionally challenged, Samson was relationally challenged, Zacchaeus was vertically challenged. He was also a tax collector, and nobody liked being around him. Jeremiah said he was too young. Sarah said she was too old. Paul was no Dale Carnegie in the tech department, and Peter was the poster boy for spiritual attention deficit disorder. <laughs> These are the all-stars of God's team. God changed the world through people like that. What can he do with someone like you? <laughs> Serving doesn't just change our world. It actually changes you. Something happens when you start serving. Your eyes start being opened. You start seeing needs where you didn't see them before, but you also see something else. This is phenomenal. You see the potential of a person. You start getting glimpses of what God created someone to be or to do. And you find ways to help them not just meet a need, but become who God intended. It's amazing what you will see when you serve. It's amazing what you will get to participate in when you're willing to serve. Our world has more than enough people on the sidelines. We've turned life into a spectator sport. It desperately needs people who will use an ability, a skill, an opportunity to help someone in need or to help someone become what God intended. So how deep was this driven into the psyche of Jesus, the Son of God? Well. It's his last meal with his closest followers. He's got a lot on his mind. He knows exactly what's going to happen. But he makes another calculation. He still has time to serve one more time. Everybody else in that room has got a lot more days left on the calendar of their life than he does. You can count his in hours. Not Jesus. And yet he goes, I've got time to serve once more. Now, back in those days, they didn't sit around a table. They reclined around the table. And back in those days, they didn't wear shoes. They wore sandals. And back in those days, you shared the paths and the streets and the roads with animals. And so when you came into a house, your feet were a hot mess. And nobody wanted that job of washing someone's feet. It was always the responsibility of the lowest servant in the household. And there wasn't anybody there for that job that night. And so Jesus gets up and he takes off his outer garments and he wraps himself in a towel and he pours water into a bowl, into a basin. And he goes around and he washes the feet of every single person in the room. Every single person. For the rest of their lives, every time they heard water being poured into a basin, they would think, Jesus is here. And they would be right it's not hard to see the image of Jesus etched in stained glass or to find him in passionate worship, but can you see him in the broken and the needy? Can you see him in the wounded and the weak? And if you can, then you will serve in ways that change the world and change your life. Let's bow our heads this morning. Father, our, our lives are full, and, and we have lots of responsibilities. Responsibilities with family and work. We have hopes and dreams, things that we hope we can accomplish and we're saving towards or working towards. And I don't think you've come to tell us that any of that is bad. I think you want us to be responsible people. But I think you want us to see something other than just what we're trying to accomplish for ourselves or for those that we love. Help us see that our world is filled full of a kind of brokenness that people just don't recover from. It doesn't matter how much time they have. There's a kind of brokenness that they just can't find enough pain relief from. It doesn't matter how much medication they consume. And that what will make a difference in their lives is not getting them out of our sight or trying to medicate them out of their mind. What makes a difference is when we put on a t towel and we grab a bowl and we decide there's something we can do to make a difference. Help us never doubt you will use us to make a difference. In 
Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together this morning.